Arkansas Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit at the University of Arkansas. Um, I want to start off by acknowledging my co-authors, um, Drs. Kyle Drake and Doug Hoser with Friends Cities Canada, who have been really instrumental in getting a lot of the data together for this project, and also my advisor, um, Dr. David Burns. Um, so, kind of preaching to the choir and the migration symposium, talking about the importance of migration and stopover, um, but that's what we're going to begin. Um, so stopover migration or stopover during migration is um, a really unknown time of the year for many species of birds. And um, we don't really know for a lot of species how it's impacting their population biology or how it may be impacting their ability to get from point A to point B. Um, this is especially true for a lot of species of wetland birds. We've lost most of our wetlands um, in the continental US and many areas like Missouri where I work greater than 60%. Um, which has a lot of implications for many species, um, including migratory birds. Waterfowl connectivity has been studied to some extent, and that's how we have a lot of our ideas about flyways um, within North America. Um, but while you know, there's a lot more to be done there too, but for many other wetland species, like the rails that I work with, um, their connectivity and whether or not their connectivity is similar to waterfowl is pretty much completely unknown. Um, and for rails and many other small species that have no known site fidelity, Getting at this connectivity can be very challenging, um, and that's what I'm trying to do with my dissertation. Okay, so why rails and why stabilized toes? Um, well, rails are really cool, but in addition to that, um, they're also really important connections between wetland systems. Um, they're wetland obligates, they're really important parts of the food chain, um, and in some species, like the yellow rail, they're almost completely unknown. Um, they're one of the least studied birds in North America, which is pretty remarkable since it's a continent of pretty well studied birds. Um, Sora and Virginia rail, so Sora is the yellow-billed one there, Virginia is the one on the top, and yellow is in the lower right. Um, Sora and Virginia rail are also game species. Um, and if we want to be able to sustainably um, manage these populations into the future, we need to be able to understand how they're moving across the landscape. Um, so they're elusive, poorly studied wetland obligates with no known site fidelity, which really leaves us with one option at this point, which is stable isotopes. Um, isotopes, especially stable hydrogen, has the advantage that we only need to capture the bird one time. Um, instead of putting out something like geolocators, which requires us to encounter the bird a second time. There have been less than 100 instances where a banded rail has been recaptured since the beginning of the bird banding lab. This is a problem for us. So yes, um, there has been one study that just came out in Waterbirds with Chris Butler and his authors that looked at yellow rails, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so sample collection. Um, I was able to go up to Saskatchewan, um, the home lake area, in central Saskatchewan last summer, and catch a bunch of birds of all three species so that we could um, see how the values there compare to kind of the general hydrogen isotope map. Um, and then we were also able to get birds during autumn migration. Um, last autumn, states that are filled in with purple are where we were able to obtain SOAR samples. Orange dots are Virginia rails, and yellow dots are yellow rails. We ended up with 120 migrating SOAR samples nine Virginia rail samples, and seven yellow rail samples. Um, we can talk more about why I have such a hard time finding Virginia rails, but that's like a whole other dissertation. Um, so just for those who aren't familiar with how stable hydrogen isotopes work, um, the general idea is that these values in precipitation vary from roughly southeast to northwest across North America. And when that rain falls out of the sky, it's taken up into the plants and then into the animals that are in that environment. And when the bird um, grows its feather, on the breeding grounds, that signature is trapped in the feather. So we can, when they leave the breeding grounds, after they've molted and we catch them in migration, we can pull a feather and look at that value and use it to relate back to where they came from. Okay. Um, so one of the problems that people often have with um, using isotope data is that we end up with these very broad bands of assignment. Um, so this is assignment for a Virginia rail that was captured in Louisiana for a different project that I was a part of. Um, and this is you know, a very, very broad area that this individual may be from, um, which can be informative, <laughs> but it's um, helpful often to try and incorporate other sources of data to improve that. Um, so myself and Alex Sullivan and a couple others looked at using species distribution models created from eBird data to try and look at Virginia rails, and that was recently published. Um, and in this part of my dissertation, we're building off of that. But instead of using species distribution models from eBird data, which has some issues because it's presence-only data and you know, citizen science data is not evenly distributed across space and time, um, in this case, we're taking advantage of the regional, state, and provincial marsh bird monitoring programs that Bird Studies Canada and many different places here in the US have been doing. So this map here, um, 
the right is where all of these different counts were done. Um, this data spans quite a bit of time. Um, but we were able to take those data along with 21 environmental covariates related to mean temperature at different times of the year, precipitation, um, and wetland cover, and try and model um, each species using logistic regression across that space. Um, we were a little bit limited in the covariates we could incorporate because finding continuous information across an international boundary was more difficult than I thought it would be. Um, but we, we made an attempt. Um, and then this species distribution model was used as a Bayesian prior to assign those individuals um, following the, um, the methods of Van Wildenberg and Hobson from ecological applications. Um, so for our model results, um, for Virginia rail, the only variable that was of any significance was the standard deviation of temperature. So this is how much temperature varies throughout the year. Um, Virginia rails, I've tried a lot of different ways of trying to find better ways to model them, and it was very challenging. So our species distribution model for Virginia rails wasn't very informative. Um, for SORAs and for yellow rails, um, we were able to get several covariates, or find, we found that several covariates in the top model were significant, including mean temperature of the driest quarter, mean temperature of the warmest quarter, mean monthly temperature range, which is kind of getting a little bit of variability, and then the presence of non-forested wetlands. Okay, so we're going to go through three different slides that look like this. Um, so in the upper right, or upper left hand corner, excuse me, we have the assignment of all of the rails that we caught without any species distribution models. So this is just the isotopes. Then this here is the species distribution model. And then this is the isotopic assignment with the species distribution model incorporated. Um, so for yellow rail, we're only looking at nine samples. Um, these birds were captured in mostly in Missouri, but we also have two birds from Mississippi. Um, and these results very much uh, mirror what Butler et al. found. They found that their birds that were wintering in Texas and Oklahoma were spending the summer roughly right here. Um, and they also used sulfur, which allowed them to eliminate this area along the Hudson Bay, which is brackish. We were not able to use sulfur, so we can't eliminate that. Um, but our results do overlap with what Butler et al. found. For Virginia rail, um, this is only a handful of samples, and they're spread out kind of strangely over geography, um, but it's sort of important, hopefully. Um, so our species distribution model suggests that we have kind of higher densities of Virginia rails up in Canada than around the Great Lakes, which based on everyone I've talked to probably doesn't really represent reality, but this is also getting at the challenges we had in creating a species distribution model for them. We probably need more information that relates to actual wetland structure, and we weren't able to find that. Um, but regardless, if you, if you look at this map, or if you look at this map, the Virginia rails that we caught in Missouri, the one that was found in South Carolina, and I believe we also have one from Louisiana. Anyway, um, they were mostly spending the summer either in the Southern Great Lakes or possibly coming in from Nebraska, Kansas, or Colorado. SORAs represent the bulk of our sample size. This is over 100 birds, um, the majority of which are from right here in the Mississippi Flyway, so Minnesota, Missouri, Arkansas, and Louisiana. Um, and those birds are doing probably exactly what we would have expected them to. They are flying roughly north and spending their summers in central Canada. Um, we did have a little bit of east to west variation. The couple of sorids that were caught in South Carolina were from a little bit farther east, um, coming over here a little bit more into Quebec. But the, it, the sample size is really small, so it's not statistically different. So I think if we had had a larger sample size in South Carolina, we might start to see some differentiation. Um, so a lot of this just kind of reveals that we need better information kind of across the landscape of what's going on so we can build better species distribution models. Um, we also would like to incorporate better data from the East Coast. Um, we did have some data from New York via the Birth Studies Canada data set, but we didn't have a lot of good marsh bird monitoring data from the Northeast, which since um, all but three of our birds were from the central part of the U.S., probably did not influence our results, but could have. Um, so we need to seek out better data there. We'd also like to bring in additional isotopes, so we were limited by funding in this case, um, especially since um, Chris Butler and had all found sulfur would be very helpful for those species that are sometimes in brackish habitat. Um, and my dream would really be to use other forms of tracking to look at connectivity and try and get at full annual cycle connection between sites, because this only lets us backtrack one way. We can't jump forward to where they're going on the breeding grounds, or excuse me, the wintering grounds. Um, you know, we think that a lot of these birds are spending time on the Gulf Coast, but there is some evidence that some of them are continuing down in New Mexico and Central America, and that is, as far as I know, completely unstudied at this point. So it's kind of my dream for the future. But um, yeah. I'd like to acknowledge the many wonderful technicians who spent a lot of nights 
getting very buggy and how we may catch all the new birds. Um, we received funding from the Garden Club of America Scholarship and from the co op And so, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions.